Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is André Torre. I'm the president of the ERSA, European Regional Science Association. And I have the pleasure to welcome you for our first ERSA COVID battle. Uh, and now the, the nowadays, the first round is between uh, two very interesting speakers, Wolfgang Petzold and Sebastian Bourdin. And it is about the following topic, COVID-19 towards regional European policy. So we'll proceed as follow. First, I will give the floor to Wolfgang. He will make a presentation of his uh, um, work. Then Sebastian will react. Then Sebastian will present as well uh, the, his own topic. Wolfgang will react and we will open the floor to the discussion. So please do not hesitate to put your question in the Q&A and I will uh, follow them and I will ask them to the, um, to the speakers. So first of all, let me introduce you the first speaker. So the first speaker is Wolfgang Petzold. Wolfgang is currently Deputy Director for Communication at the European Committee of the Regions for which he works since 280. And before, he has been a European, uh, European Commission official for 10 years, among others as deputy head of unit for communication at DG Regio, and also for another 10 years in regional ministries in Germany. So Wolfgang also holds a PhD uh, uh, or a degree in sociology and is part-time lecturer for European studies at the University for Applied Sciences in Bremen. And then most of all, or let's say Cherry uh, on the top, is all, he can also publish articles and books on EU affairs and in particular on cohesion policy. So Wolfgang, the floor is yours now. Yeah, thank you very much, Andre, uh, Sebastian, and also to the team of, uh, of ERSA. I'm very glad to be with you. And as um, Andre has said, I will, care, I will share a couple of slides with you. And I believe that either they have been sent to you already or you will receive them after, after this um, event. Um, yeah, I'm glad to share with you these slides, but also some personal thoughts and reflections on an issue which is dominating public life since exactly one year, because as some of you will have noticed, this debate is exactly one day after the um, World Health Organization has declared COVID-19 as a pandemic, which happened on the 11th of March, 2020. As researchers, experts, and public officials, we will have COVID-19 and its impact on our desks for quite some time. Uh, I'm happy to shed some light on what the Committee of the Regions and other regional and local stakeholders have been doing recently uh, and will do and continue to do in the months and maybe even in the years to come. Let me please repeat the three questions that I will try to answer. So in fact, my presentation is divided up into three parts. So the first question I try to answer is, how is the COVID-19 pandemic addressed at regional and local level? By addressed, I mean by regional and local authorities. The second question I'd like to shed some light on is, how do citizens feel about public interventions by the EU, by member states, and also by their local and regional constituencies. And the third and last question um, uh, I try to answer is how has the EU and mainly through its financing and budget reacted to the crisis and what does this mean for regions and cities? So these are the three questions I try to answer and I think I will use something like 20 minutes. And again, I'm happy to not only reply to the um, remarks of um, Sebastian, but also, also to answer questions from the audience, if there are any. Before I start, let me briefly describe um, my environment, because I noticed from the list that most of you work in universities, being students or researchers or postdocs or PhD students. And um, you might not um, imagine the life of a 
public official of an EU institution or body that I am. So I'm not speaking to you, and I like to underline this, I'm not speaking to you as a researcher. I'm speaking to you as a surfer, a surfer of academic research, uh, which is absolutely necessary for a public institution. And throughout my career, I must say, I've always followed, uh, I've never stopped following what research tells us, uh, especially about regional, local, and European questions, because I'm strongly convinced that evidence-based uh, evidence policymaking, as we say these days, is absolutely necessary uh, to have good policy output. And for the committee, such output is mainly enshrined in reports, uh, sometimes in studies, most of the time in opinions uh, that some of you might have heard of, most of you, I guess, have not heard of, opinions that local and regionally elected politicians agree upon. So the committee, if you want to understand it in one sentence, is a parliament of regional and local politicians who issue per year about 50 to 60 pop, uh, opinions that they send then to the EU institutions, uh, mainly the commission, but also the parliament and the council to make the case for regional and local concerns. Um, so our people, let's say our members, there are 329 of them from all regions, from all levels of government, starting with municipalities, regions, counties, cities. So we have mayors, uh, regional presidents, we have regional ministers. And these people come only six or 10 times a year, or they used to come, now they are all virtually connected to the COR, as we call it. And they discuss these questions. And of course, very much so the impact of, um, of COVID-19. And the last remark before I start my presentation is this one. Um, please don't read it or understand it as something that is hammered into stone. I think we must all be aware, and sometimes including in academic articles, I have the feeling that people um, pretend that they know what's best or they know what are the causes and the reasons behind uh, phenomena that we are watching. I don't believe that. I think the jury is still out. This is not over. This is still happening. And government reactions at any, at any level still have to take this into account, which uh, makes the whole case, if you want, quite confusing or positively said, unique. So let me start my presentation. The first um, map I'd like to share with you is in fact a map that is worth 750 billion euros. Why am I saying this? This map, uh, some of you might have seen it again, pictures um, what um, the Joint Research Center of the European Commission came up with in the months of April and May 2020. So just before the European Commission proposed after a German-French um, initiative, a package of 750 billion of loans and grants, not to regions, but to member states, on top of the EU budget, which as at that time, in last year, April, May, hadn't been agreed upon. So for the first time, and after some discussions about whether or not um, the EU should be able to create bonds, which is not the name of the, of the game here, but if it's um, able to, to take credits from the market, loans from the market, after a couple of years, this was finally decided in the face of the crisis. And this map um, made it into a staff working document that accompanied on the 27th of May, the proposal by the European Commission of this big package of 750 million, which was a complete game changer, I'd say, uh, on the budget negotiations. Um, uh, that went on until December, in fact, of last year between the Council and the Parliament. So what they did here, and some of you are aware with the methodology, they, they took um, uh, the economic forecast of spring last year and they evaluated how uh, the economic fabric of regions at NUT2 level might be impacted uh, both without any responses. So the idea was there is an ongoing lockdown and uh, for example, the ex exports that was the assumption at the time go down by something like 9.2% in 2020. And they estimated that the regional GDP would fall 
for up to 25% in the left scenario. In the right scenario, they estimated that there would be a government um, uh, reaction to it in the order of 0.4 of the GDP plus some liquidity aids to, um, to um, enterprises. And that would kind of um, ease a little bit the burden on, on regional GDP. And that such a map was used as evidence um, to underpin one of the biggest programs worldwide that was initiated, gives you a good, a good idea that geography and maps matter, if I may say so. This is another map, and I've put it into the presentation to show you that, uh, again, regions matter. This map, you don't see regional borders in it, is the attempt to summarize a rather complex um, uh, picture of different restrictions taken at national and regional level onto one European map. You see which kind of restrictions, um, and this is another map of the European Commission of the DG um, for Human, uh, for DG ECHO, it's called abbreviated. So you see here different colors of countries. First of all, these are um, COVID cases, as you can see from the legend. But then uh, most importantly, you see which kind of um, restrictive measures they have pictured here. And I just want to draw your attention. I don't want to talk too long about this map, which is only irregularly updated. So I think they have produced since COVID-19 only three or four maps of this kind. But you see from the light blue color that is underlaying some of the restrictive me measures, this indicates to you that regions are in charge, of course, for you living in the countries um, impacted by this, that's absolutely clear. But again, between countries, we have regional, different regional borders, different regional competences. But the dominance of the light blue color here of the restrictive measures tells you that regions are on duty. They are in charge indeed. And this has been kind of underpinned by other maps that um, the council has agreed upon, regional maps, in fact, that shows you um, all the incidences and even sometimes um, put travel bans or travel restrictions on uh, regional borders within the countries. Uh, just to give you one example, in Italy, it's absolutely clear when you live in Campania, now you can't leave Campania, uh, which is a, you know in the south of Italy, you can't visit your, your relatives, this kind of stuff. And it's even below the level of regions. In the north of Germany, we had, we had for a couple of weeks, one city, uh, with a lockdown, but all the region, the regional area around it did not have a lockdown. So these are really absolutely unusual measures and they put big question marks into the mindsets of people, of course. So you, if you haven't noticed yet, I'm a map lover. So map number three shows you a map that Spatial Foresight together with some other institutes produced for the Committee of the Regions in May, June last year. It shows to you the um, sensitivity and the exposure of regions. Sensitivity being uh, defined by, again, the economic fabric at NUTS2 level. We have economic data from Eurostat that uh, make, make it possible to, to look into the, um, uh, the effects in case you have, for example, um, a drop in, in exports. By the way, I mentioned the estimate um, that the Joint Research Center made, uh, made for the first map I showed to you at the time. So we talk about spring, say April 2020. Uh, it was estimated at 9.2%. And in fact, the import, uh, sorry, the export uh, drop uh, based on the latest data now published a couple of days ago by Eurostat, it was 94 of an export drop. So quite close to the reality, what uh, the colleagues thought at that time. So this map, back to this map again, shows you that indeed uh, the patterns uh, that we normally know as regards GDP or of um, exposure and needs of regions for public support is quite different um, with the red areas here being uh, possibly not only higher as exposed due to their um, uh, economic fabric, but also of higher sensitivity. So this was published, um, as you can see, in July 2020 and entered into a bigger report, the Committee of the Region issued called the Region and Local Barometer Report about some of you might have heard. 
The committee is not only doing reports. As I told you, we have a lot of politicians, uh, people who are you know, in daily contact with citizens. So we ask them to tell us, um, like other institutions and organizations did, what are you doing? What are, what, what's the local action that happens? And we did uh, what we call a COVID exchange platform, uh, some examples of which you can see here. So we did this quite early. In fact, I think we were the first institution doing so, and then others followed. And you have now collections of such local examples, for example, through the ESPON program. Uh, and I think Sebastian was involved in a study um, on this. He will tell us about, I'm quite sure. And um, also Interact Europe is doing organizing such exchange and, and the OECD. By the way, if you see my slides and um, you see always kind of underlined and interactive links indeed. So when you click on these uh, links, you get um, the reports, the studies or the original um, websites. Um, three weeks ago, another platform um, was published. It's called Reinventing Cities and EuroCities, an EU-wide um, organization of larger cities. And I think they have members, member cities in the order of 180 uh, Europe-wide. And they have collected from their members uh, about 70 examples and uh, 25 initiatives taken by EuroCities, all aiming at exchanging experiences and, and uh, different views on COVID-19 and how cities should look like in the future. Um, when it comes to um, the expectations of local authorities, uh, also their experiences, um, maybe it's interesting to see that the OECD and the CUR work together on a study. In fact, uh, a survey done among 300 local actors, so not politicians, but people working in local and uh, regional authorities. And what you can see here is an idea of, um, let's say, what they think is lacking in terms of coordination. Um, this has put loads of pressures, not only on individual people, but also on governments. And what our local um, colleagues tell us is that indeed, um, they are under this pressure and they see a higher need of coordination of such policies, re policy responses, possibly not a surprise for anybody in this call. What sometimes is um, looked only uh, at by people who really like politics, elections and all kinds of stuff is the impact of COVID-19 on democracy. It's a big word, democracy, I know, but what I mean by this is that, of course, elections, election dates, uh, the way in which election campaigns are run, the way in which politicians can communicate with their citizens, all this is under pressure. So what I did for you and for the sake of this uh, meeting today, I looked into um, all subnational elections that were planned or happened indeed um, since March uh, 2020, 2020, sorry. And I looked into this until the end of this year, and you can see that the stronger colors here, mainly France and in Italy, indeed regional elections had to be postponed in, in the case of France, including on the municipal level for a couple of months because there was no solution of how to make them safe. But again, it's, la it's larger than that. It's not only about elections and the way in which people make their crosses on, on, on the voting uh, features. It's, it's more about also in the way in which political communication is happening. And I come to that, come back to that point in a minute. Most if people are interested in this. I like to advise you to go to um, see the lower link there, EDR, which is the name or the abbreviation of, an, of the International Institute uh, for Elections and observe, Observing Elections. So it's a global, globally um, uh, engaged uh, institute and they have a European section where you can find more details especially on the way in which these elections are carried out and which kind of ideas have come up. My second question comes uh, now, or the answer to it, which is, and I'll be faster now, promise uh, to Andre. Um, I'm, I'm going uh, to you uh, with you to, to some slides, some findings from public opinion polls. The big players here, as some of you might know, are of course, the European Commission, the European Parliament, but the European Commission, uh, the European Committee of the Regions also has carried out a survey uh, in September last year, and I present only some of the results of it. 
So this is quite fresh. So fresh from the press, as we say. So in February 21, a couple of days ago, uh, this is, a, is a re the result of a, a survey done by Barometer for the European Parliament. And you can say uh, at national level how people estimate the impact on their personal income. In fact, to summarize, um, more than half of the people think that uh, COVID-19 will impact on, their, uh, on the situation of their country and in fact also on their personal, in, uh, personal um, situation uh, for the years to come or for the year to come. What's surprising maybe for some is that 50%, so again, half of the citizens, it's always representative, so they ask usually 30,000 citizens in EU27, have a, still a positive image of the EU, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but they, and they have um, on the other side also questions on the direction both the EU and their countries are taking. So it's a bit, maybe a bit um, contradictory. And good news for everybody who is in favor of solidarity, the highest ever level of people say, ever measured, say that solidarity be between the member states matters. So this is, if you want, messages that the parliament, of course, takes into its political deliberations with the member states uh, by claiming that um, there must be more coordinated action, for example, from the EU level on issues like health policy. Um, what is also maybe striking is that, in fact, uh, the levels of satisfaction with both uh, government and EU activities have, um, have, have risen to some, to some degree, which is underpinning the message that, in fact, people expect that more coordinated um, activities are carried out at the supranational level. Again, a positive message for the Brussels institutions if one believes in surveys, which I understand what everybody does. I spare you some of the details here because it's maybe not interesting for everybody. This is, of course, the killer graph that the committee always um, publishes when the commission publishes trust, trust being one of the highly rated values in these days, everybody speaks about trust. And when the European Commission publishes, um, which is a regular, as you can see from the timeline here, regular since uh, 2010, regular question, the Eurobarometer that is carried out twice a year, it turns out that people trust more the EU than they trust the national government. They never publish the results of the green line, which only the Committee of the Regions does, which shows that indeed we are 20 percentage points higher than the other two governments level, levels uh, on which we are of course quite proud and which is confirmed by by recent polls now i show you some results of our survey as published we carried that out with kantar uh, the methodology was uh, these were online interviews online polls and they were carried out in lead in september and published in october together with our barometer report and this graph confirms that different from one country to the other, you will find your approbation and the flag below. Uh, but people on average trust more local and regional governments um, than they trust their national government and the EU. Um, this is quite close. These uh, levels are quite close, but indeed different from one country to the others. Local authorities are expected and most trusted to act positively on the crisis. Um, this is again another uh, absolutely recent report that was only published this week uh, by the Parliament and the Commission, and it has to do with the future, um, future conference on the future of Europe. So what people are also expecting that, um, and it's up to or almost two thirds of them saying that the pandemic made them think about the future of Europe and its competencies. So that is good news again for everybody who is a friend of um, the Conference on the Future of Europe, of Europe in, in particular. And uh, it was, of course, published um, due to the fact that this week, some of you might have noticed on the 10th of March, indeed, the three presidents uh, of Council, Parliament and, and European Commission signed a joint declaration on how to conduct this conference, which will start on the 9th of May, May and end uh, in Strasbourg and end uh, possibly in spring next year before the presidential elections in France. Um, the EP again also asked about opinions on the EU's recovery plan. I'll come to that in a minute. 
And again, most of the people expect a good impact and, and have high expectations on the EU's on the EU acting uh, with money, with funds to help the national and regional economies prosper. My last question was, as you might recall, so what does how did, did the EU react when it comes to funding? And I show you some uh, figures now. Uh, some of you might be aware that we have um, a new budget, uh, which is now there for seven years. And on top of the budget, marked here in the orange um, colors, we have the agreed upon so-called um, recovery and resilience facility, which is composed of grants and loans. And as I remarked in the beginning, for the first time, the EU the mission was in fact allowed to go to the market and borrow the money, which member states have to pay back through the EU budget until 2058. So what you can see from the color code is that indeed, um, without the recovery fund, the impact would be much lower. And on top of that, you have two different uh, periods. So the EU budget lasts for seven, but the recovery fund only for three years, actually with last payments uh, foreseen in uh, 26. So uh, you see that the countries like France, Italy, uh, and Spain profit most from this new instrument, which was a reaction, if you remember the, the map, from their higher exposure to the effects and impact of the crisis. So that was, if you want, um, is still a big sign of solidarity about which some people uh, did not believe that it would happen. And it was, of course, very hard negotiations. Uh, as I said, only in December, so just five minutes before 12, the member states and the council could agree together with the parliament on the package. The impact of this package um, on regions can't be pictured. Um, this has to do with the different allocations. But what is clear is that many of these programs um, will be managed at regional level. How many? Uh, and to which extent, meaning to which extent of the funding impact is not yet known because the negotiations about national recovery plans, operational programs for the structural funds, all this is starting now. Even for the structural funds, there are no legal provisions already um, signed or published. So meaning that something is happening, but um, it is not yet 100% clear what the final picture is. What is clear, and this is what I pictured here, is that about 42% of the total, and we're talking about um, the biggest ever budget, um, in the order of something like 2% of the EU's GNI, and in some countries even more than 10% of their GDP. You see here the figures of the injection, of the funding injection, of possible funding injection, per year and citizen. So the darker the color is, the higher will be the injection. And again, all this needs to be planned across or uh, by different um, EU programs. So it's quite a heavy and complex process that is happening now and possibly takes effect towards the end of the year, or early next year. Um, my last slide or one of my last slides is before I come to conclusions is that in this funding operations and the planning are local and regional governments involved? The answer in short is not really. Um, this has mainly to do with the fact that, um, especially for the um, RRF, as it is called in Brussels, so the um, Recovery and Resilience Facility, the plans have to be national, while social partners, local and regional authorities have to be consulted, whatever that means. These two graphs show you whether they were already consulted by the end of last year, and most of the answers of our own uh, survey and one of Eurocities on the right side are negative. So they had heard about it, yes, but consultation wasn't the case, which is possibly um, a deficit. So my, I conclude that um, by, by this, and you have further deep links uh, on the, uh, if you want to find out more to studies, articles, and I was um, quite busy in collecting only very recent articles, as you can see from the dates. So. What's clear to me is that regional disparities are likely to increase within and between countries and they will have damaging effects on convergence, on people's income and so on. And uh, this is news towards uh, the renewal of regional policies, which for the time being might, might be in danger of being too much national 
uh, nationally driven, nation driven. Um, people, um, there are some, there's some evidence, early evidence that societal inequalities increase. We had in Germany just this week, a study that of course COVID-19 strikes harder the poor people than it strikes the rich ones. In fact, that the uh, rich poor divide is increasing. And I think that is the case in many other countries. So the famous EU geographies of discontent might increase. And you have some articles that would argue in this direction. And on politics, my conclusion would be that we had indeed a, a strong solidarity movement that was combined with some conditionality. Remember the rule of law discussion with Hungary and Poland being exposed to some criticisms and rules that they tried to come, that they tried to circumvent. And we have, of course, and that's a perception of the citizens that is to me absolutely clear, a high uh, multi-level complexity instead of governance. So it's in, even in my country, uh, Germany, People are quite struggling with the different decisions that are now taken on a, in a weekly, in a weekly uh, rhythm. So the risk is there, as for the places uh, argument, that a spatially blind reaction at any level of government will not um, do the trick. And finally, uh, people again, there is some hope that at least um, among the Brussels crowds that the Conference of the Euro uh, on the Future of Europe might give voice and visibility to regions and cities. And uh, this is one of my bigger projects on which I'm just working, uh, let's say, on a daily basis to make sure that this is not only a conference of um, politicians, but also, also a conference where citizens have their say. And the joint declaration that was signed this week in the parliament by the three institutions uh, includes for me at least some hope that this will be the case and that we will have uh, a Europe closer to the citizens, which is one of the uh, main messages of the Committee of the Regions. In the last slide, you have some things coming up, but I spare you this. And I thank Andrew for uh, Andre for his patience, and I'm happy to uh, to listen now to Sebastian or to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Wolfgang, for this very uh, comprehensive uh, overview about the situation. I would say something like the situation is serious, but it's not desperate, so we can have hope in the future. So maybe uh, Sebastian share this view or not. So Sebastian, you can briefly react, please. Yes, yes, yes. thank you, Wolfgang, for this very rich uh, presentation. So I agree with you on the fact that uh, the, the coordination between the states and between the regions has not been uh, sufficient. And in particular, uh, we can say that cross-border management uh, has not always been coordinated. So mm. I'd like to have your opinion on this cross-border management of the pandemics, because it seems that uh, it uh, didn't function. Um, you mentioned that the, plat uh, the, the platform for the exchange of good practices between cities and regions, uh, so it's an excellent initiative, but how can we make it better known? Because uh, how can mm -hmm. cities and regions better appropriate these good practices? Because these platforms are unfortunately uh, not sufficiently uh, well known. Yeah. And... Uh, Yes, I also appreciated the fact that it highlights uh, the confidence that European citizens have in the, the different levels of crisis uh, management, European, national, regional. And at the same time, there are a lot of differences between countries. So it could be interesting in the future to analyze the, these differences between countries uh, on the level of confidence between, of trust between uh, European, national and, and regional level. And, uh, and the idea would be to see to what extent anti-system parties like populist parties uh, has influenced this perception of the EU's management of the, the pandemic, mm. even that these parties have continued to denounce the uh, EU's management of COVID-19, in particular the management of uh, the vaccines. So I think that in the future, it could be very interesting to, to see how this, uh, this uh, anti-system parties as influ are going to influence the perception of the uh, 
EU's management of the pandemic. Again, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Okay, well, yeah. Thank you, Sebastian. Just very briefly, because we might have questions. I'm not so sure how we look like uh, Andre, but very briefly. Yeah, I excluded cross-border um, management to say so during the crisis because it has been quite a heartbreaking fact and story, especially between the two countries that we are from, Sebastian. And um, nevertheless, um, this is a problem. Uh, it is a problem, I'd say, that has to do with the fact that uh, there is still kind of internal policies more national than there are European, which is also true, by the way, for health. Mm -hmm. You can always see the glass half full, half, half empty as usual. I'd say that after the shocks that we have seen from you know, people being pushed away into, back into their countries who have to commute on a daily basis because they have their jobs on the other side of the world. I think this was mainly the case in between Alsace and uh, Baden-Württemberg, uh, or Saarland and, and, and Alsace. So I think this was really bad, but there were reactions then, possibly too late. Uh, as a communicator, I also regret very much the fact that the first planes and the first doctors that were flown in, at least in the media, came from China in the north of Italy. And um, this leads me also to already directly to your third question about the perception of things. I mean, there have been many people um, working hard in Brussels, I can tell you, on turning this image. Um, and um, it was again maybe a case that confirms that the power of Europe, the power of Brussels being far away from the national media scenes is, is, is quite um, limited. I mean, if you have a national discourse uh, that is against the EU, um, at least when you believe again opinion polls, which is the case in Italy. I mean, you had uh, early last year, you had a higher proportion of people in public opinion polls saying that uh, Italy should leave the European Union then you had um, people who were favoring a membership of Italy in the European Union. So you have different situations. You have, of course, different political parties being active and, 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 and they make a case out of this, no doubt about that. And if it's against the EU and if it uh, serves their purpose, they will continue to do so. Do I think that this is all unjustified because the EU is just, you know, shining and is just a good guy in this game? No, I don't think so. I'm quite um, convinced that everybody makes mistakes. The, the big thing here is that sometimes we don't get to the point when these mistakes can be reflected upon because the message is out, including through social media, which play an eminent role here, I'd say. Um, the only positive thing I see is that, I don't know what you think about the presidential elections, Sebastian and Andre, and I don't want, don't want uh, to open a Pandora box here. The two regional elections that we have in front of us in Germany that I mentioned on that map, which are happening next Sunday in Baden-Württemberg, 10 million, and Rheinland-Pfalz, I believe, in the order of 5 million. The AfD, which is our populist um, party, um, isn't very high in the ranks. They look better than they should, but not as good as someone would imagine uh, and, uh, maybe in another country. So that is good. Yeah, and I agree that's the last point I'd like to make and um, is that indeed uh, we need to look deeper into these national differences in public opinion. Um, DG Regio is planning, and it's on my last slide, um, a regional uh, opinion survey because you have also different opinion, opinions um, on government behavior, on the, on the crisis as such, in different regions. Mm -hmm. And this will come out in... Um, in uh, in October this year, I believe, including on people's views on how regional policy should be redesigned. And so I'm looking forward to this, um, yeah. but I can also only confirm that um, the EU institutions will produce more of this stuff. And again, I think the Conference on the Future of Europe and, an in, and an, a platform that will be created for this very soon, multilingual platform, by the way, um, is, is, is a good thing. Uh, you meant speaking about platforms, just one more point. I think I fully agree to what you say. The platforms are not only not known, but sometimes it's just kind of a black box where people put their examples in. So what's missing here is, um, how can I say, knowledge creaming and the creation of um, networks of knowledge 
among local actors. I know it's happening, but maybe not enough. I fully agree to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your response. Now we go uh, immediately to the second presentation. And this is a presentation of uh, Sebastian. So Sebastian Bourdin is a professor in economic geography and he's also associate dean of a faculty at the EM Normandy Business School. Uh, he's working on the evaluation of public policies, cohesion policy, regional development, and circular economy. And he has recently been the project leader of an ESPON study of the geography of COVID-19, and he will present today the results uh, and the first results and then the consolidated results about this research. So, Sebastian, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, for ERSA to organize this COVID battle. So I'm going to present a work that has been recently published in a ESPON report, as you mentioned. So thank you to my co-authors from University of Fiash, Romania, University of Calabria in Italy, and from University of Paris Nanterre in France. So in this study, we concentrated on the first wave of the pandemic. So I will mainly talk about this first wave. So I just would like to also mention that many papers have been published recently in regional science, and it proves that regional scientists are particularly well placed to deal with this, uh, these issues with a, a spatial territorial uh, dimension. So first of all, I'm going to, have to uh, come back to the geography of COVID-19. So COVID-19 has killed just over 2,600,000 people worldwide. And as you know, we have experienced three major waves. So with the last two waves being particularly close together, putting a strain on the, on the healthcare uh, system. So it is estimated that the excess mortality rate uh, in the world is about 45%. In Europe, it's 40%. But this figure shows uh, many disparities between countries and within uh, countries. So this is the reason why we, we worked at the, at the um, local level and uh, the unprecedented uh, crisis we are currently experiencing with the coronavirus pandemic is part of an evolving spatial temporal uh, process. And uh, in order to map the circulation uh, of the virus, we created uh, an original geodatabase uh, uh, on the regional scale at NET2 and NET3 with uh, data on daily deaths uh, across Europe. And we collected data from the beginning of fe February uh, to, the, to the end of uh, August. So as it can be observed uh, during the first months to the pandemic, the first cases were strictly limited to some regions in Italy, in France, and in Spain. And over the, the following weeks, the COVID-19 uh, epidemic spread and throughout the continent. And at the end of May, high levels of test ratio were also recorded uh, in other uh, European countries, such as United Kingdom, Belgium, or, or Sweden. So most of the regions located in the Baltic countries and in Eastern and South uh, Eastern Europe were spared by uh, the first wave, and we'll come back uh, on this uh, issue uh, after. So nevertheless, it should be noted that the places where uh, COVID-19 emerged in Europe are not solely based on metropolitan logics. Indeed, the virus has found favorable development conditions uh, in other places, uh, and uh, this unexpected second phase arose as a game changer and shaped uh, the peculiar uh, regional geography of the first wave. And for example, COVID-19 found favorable circulation conditions through what we call the super spreading events, which had an accelerating effect. So in France, for example, the religious conference in Eastern France. In Italy, there, were a football, there was a football game in the Northern of Italy, the carnival festivities in Western Germany, and a night event in a ski resort in the Austrian Alps. And all these super spreading events contributed to spread relocation uh, diffusion through uh, regional uh, mobility. So what uh, was uh, interesting is to try to map with using, by using a spatial autocorrelation uh, method to map the uh, spatial concentration of uh, 
COVID-19 deaths across time. And what we can see is that uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, hot, point, hot points of the epidemic uh, were in Italy, in Spain, and in Belgium, and the west part of Germany have high clustering. And uh, the high clustering recorded in France at the starting point in the eastern region, but rapidly spread out from the east to the Ile-de-France region, for example. And on the contrary, Central and Eastern Europe seem to, uh, to be spared, uh, so with low, low clustering. And through visual analyzing, analysis between the four maps, uh, and when you compare the map one with the two other maps, we can, we can, dis we can uh, see um, a distinctive geographical patterns. So first of all, the lockdown seems to have had the expected effects since for the April, May and June, July uh, periods, the evolution of the number of new deaths is uh, low in a large part of the areas. Uh, and uh, it should be noted also that over the April, May uh, period, the United Kingdom and Ireland experienced an explosion in the number of deaths. So this can be explained by the late decision to implement a containment in, in UK. And as you can see also for Sweden, uh, which did not implant, implement any uh, containment measure, uh, Sweden recorded a significant uh, increase in the number of deaths for the, from the same per period. So this is basically a, a general overview of the, of the COVID-19. And after the first cases were reported in Europe, some studies pointed out that European regions were not equally hit, uh, and, uh, and that strong differences existed between the peripheral uh, regions and the core uh, regions. So the idea of uh, this uh, uh, second part is to uh, address the question of uh, what are the determinants that can explain the geography of COVID-19? So to uh, deal with this question, we applied spatial econometrics model to assess the, these determinants. So we distinguished uh, different groups of indicators, as you can see on the table. So we uh, take into account demographic determinants, income and health determinants, and the uh, the health care determinants and, um, and some proxies about the governance quality in the region, and also uh, an indicator that describes the, the region typology between the uh, urban and intermediate uh, rural uh, regions. So I'm going to present briefly uh, the most important result. The, the first one is that uh, urban regions are more affected, okay, so the, the very rapid global spread of the pandemic has been driven by uh, what we call uh, reticular proximities, so the major metropolises and urban regions were particularly affected, so I think to uh, Milan, Paris, etc. Another uh, important uh, um, um, output of our analysis is that this density doesn't play a role uh, um, all the time. I mean, at the initial stages of the pandemic, density was playing a role. Uh, so COVID-19 hits uh, first the metropolises and region the more connected to the globalization, but not anymore afterwards. So why? Why it is less the density that matters in the contagion than the type of density and the relational den intensity of this, uh, of this, uh, of this den density. So for example, um, uh, low density is not necessarily a protective factor for rural areas. And we have a lot of case studies that mention that, that, that where we can see that uh, uh, when a uh, rural area has been uh, hit, the impact was uh, aggravated because uh, the lack of uh, health care facilities in these rural areas. Uh, another important uh, thing that we can say is that uh, uh, regions where life expectancy is higher are more affected. So this is uh, specifically the case for Italy and Spain. Uh, Italy and Spain has uh, uh, the, the best uh, rank in terms of life expectancy. So uh, 
uh, and another question is about uh, uh, the role of the um, household composition. And I think that the household composition matters and may have played a role. For example, in Italy, the cohabitation of different generations and communal living structures between elderly and young people have exposed the elderly to uh, multiple uh, sources of, uh, of contagion. Another result is that the region with a high availability of hospital beds are, less, are the less affected. So this is a, um, an interesting uh, result. And we can see that the healthcare infrastructures have also a considerable uh, impact on the government uh, ability to uh, rapidly detect, diagnose, and report on the new uh, infections. And an interesting uh, an important uh, uh, aspect of this uh, COVID-19 management is that uh, regions with a high level of governance uh, were uh, specifically uh, affected. So we found a positive effect of quality of governance and mortality. So we have some explanations uh, in, in the case of Italy it can be assumed that they were not prepared to be the first to be affected. And even if the quality of governance is high in the northern region of Italy, there was a lot of unpreparedness. And uh, for countries such as France, uh, UK, Belgium, and Spain, which were also hit hard uh, afterwards, one can speak of uh, overconfidence in their healthcare system, in their system of governance. And I can say that in France, it was the case. We were overconfident about the possibility to manage this uh, COVID-19 crisis. And this overconfidence has led to uh, uh, a lot of impact of the COVID-19 the crisis in these countries. And concerning the Eastern countries of Europe, they were more conscious that they were less prepared to this pandemic. So they took very strict decision not to be uh, overtaken by the pandemic. So it can be uh, another explanation of this, uh, of this sign. And uh, also when we look at the evolution of the quality of governance uh, for uh, Italy, Spain, and Belgium, they are among the countries that have uh, experienced a decline in the quality of their institutions over the last years, uh, the last 20 years. And uh, even they, if they remain at higher level than the Eastern countries, uh, we can uh, say that um, the, the question of the evolution of the quality of governance has also uh, played an, uh, an important role. Another question that we have addressed is, uh, does the lockdown have been uh, effective? So for that, uh, our study uh, attempts to analyze the mechanism of the spread of the virus in the national context of Italy that became the, the European uh, epicenter of the outbreak during the first wave. So we thus address the issue of the uh, virus diffusion model. We examine in particular the spatial autocorrelation of the incidence of COVID-19 and we assess the role of lockdown to reduce this diffusion over time. So what, why, why we, we, we analyzed the Italian case, it's because uh, it's, it was the first country uh, to be confronted uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the transmission of the COVID-19 virus. And there were, therefore, it, it was interesting to provide a good basis for assessing uh, the other lockdown uh, strategies. So for, for, for analyzing this, uh, this role of the lockdown, we, we use collocation analysis technique developed by Ancelin with a bivirate local spatial association indicator to study the spatial correlation uh, patterns between two variables. And it was possible to analyze the persistence of uh, a given spatial pattern over time. And when we look at the map, we can conclude that there was persistency in the spatial concentration of incidents in Lombardy and in the south, in Lombardy for the, the high level of mortality, and in the south of Italy, uh, south of Italy, sorry, for the persistence of low level of mortality. 
So this persistency can be interpreted as lockdown effectiveness since the spatial concentration of high level incidents between the 8th and the 28th March of 2020 remains very high and localized uh, in, in space. And when you uh, look at the map, you can notice that Roma uh, experienced uh, a, persistent, a persistence of high level of mortality during March, while the surrounding regions had uh, low rates. We found uh, also that Rho is positive and significant, so it confirmed the spatial dependency effect. And when we dig further, uh, we can see a decline of uh, this, uh, of, uh, this uh, Rho uh, positive and significant uh, sign. So it means that, uh, and it confirmed that um, the lockdown that has been implemented in Italy uh, has reduced the contagion uh, effect on the other uh, regions. And uh, we also show that uh, wealthy, uh, high density regions, uh, etc., were uh, more hit in Italy at the beginning of the, the pandemic, but it's well known uh, today. Um, another important issue that I would like to address is the question of uh, the national lockdowns and the regional uh, effects, the effects on the, the regions. Um, a national lockdown will not have the same effect across regions, across cities and villages uh, it covers. The impact of uh, the lockdown also depends heavily on the resources and political, social, economic structures of the regions. And uh, therefore, uh, differences in lockdown measures need to be uh, examined in the light of the regional specificities uh, of the regions. And I have identified uh, some uh, regional characteristics that can uh, affect the uh, effects of the lockdown on the regional uh, economy. And more specifically, we can identify uh, characteristics that the manufacturing uh, uh, of uh, the, the share of man manufacturing uh, sector in, in the regions. We know that the manufacturing sector is a high risk sector because the value chain in the world has been a lot affected by this, uh, by, uh, by, by the pandemic. The real estate sector is also experiencing strong disruption on the demand side. I also identify uh, as other researchers that cultural sector and tourism were severely affected uh, sectors. Uh, lockdown measures have disrupted industrial value chains, as I mentioned before. And uh, for example, uh, regions and cities that uh, were specifically uh, um, insert in the international trade were more uh, affected too. Another issue that is important to uh, analyze when we look at the uh, differences and the disparities uh, of the effect of lockdown across uh, the region is that uh, the question of the risk of poverty and social exclusion, which is very different across Europe. And another important issue from my point of view is the question of young people. And uh, young people in 2020 are sometimes uh, labeled uh, the lost or the lockdown generation. And I think it's very true because uh, access to jobs following completion of their studies uh, continue to be blocked because of the, uh, of the uh, paralyzed uh, economy. We also assist to an acceleration of the Uber delivering services of food and in the same time, a decline of the activity of Uber private drivers. So the question of the micro entrepreneurship and self entrepreneurship is at stake across Europe. And another question uh, that is very important and uh, Wolfgang talk about it, uh, it's about the question of the debt. Member states need to mobilize a large amount of public money to support their economies and people. And it's the same things at the infranational level. And local authorities have been at the forefront of the pandemic. 
and have also invested to support the local economy and fight against social exclusion. And it has uh, an important impact uh, on, uh, on their debt. And lastly, I, I will not uh, come back on this, um, on this uh, measure, is the question of the quality of governance, which is a, a crucial uh, issue too. So at, at the total, the, the length and the stringency of the lockdown combined with the above regional uh, characteristics that I mentioned, make it possible to estimate the territoriality uh, and uh, of the impact of COVID-19. So if I take two examples, the first one concerned the, the tourist areas. The tourist areas, the impact on, uh, on tourist areas is not uniform. So it depends between domestic tourism and international uh, tourism. So for example, areas in Portugal, Croatia, Greece and Austria and cities such as uh, Paris or Milan rely on EU and extra EU uh, tourism. So they will feel the consequences of the crisis more acutely and for longer than regions relying on domestic uh, tourism, such as uh, in France. Uh, if we compare, for example, the Algarve region in Portugal is suffering more acutely from the economic impact of the crisis. Uh, because it's essentially an international tourism, uh, rather than the Gironde in, in France, which is uh, essentially uh, a domestic uh, tourism. Um, another aspect of uh, this pandemic, and we can come back uh, after uh, on the debate, is the question uh, of the importance of the digitalization and the urban-rural divide about the digitalization of Europe. And the major transformation is a much wider use of teleworking and its effects over the long term uh, changes, uh, such as increasing the attractiveness of, uh, of rural areas. So maybe we will, we will uh, come back later on this, uh, on this issue. And finally, I would like to come back on the question of the policy answer that has been uh, uh, done at the regional level. So the idea uh, of uh, that um, analysis in the ESPON uh, project was to build a grid for uh, study the policy responses at the local level. So to do that, we uh, identified different types of measures that has been taken at the uh, local level and we differentiate between uh, offensive approach and defensive approach. We look at four different uh, types of public action. So the health security, the, the daily way of life and work, the support to vulnerable populations and the support to economic actors and recovery. And we look at, we integrate uh, into the analysis, another important aspect is the temporality of the publication. That means uh, was just short-term actions, uh, short-term action that now didn't exist anymore, or it was more mid-terms or long-term action, long-term actions, it's uh, long-term, uh, it's action that will be uh, perennialized uh, after the end of the pandemic. So to do uh, this uh, uh, study, we, we list uh, different uh, case studies across Europe and uh, we, with different types of territories between urban, intermediate and rural and cities uh, territories. And what we, can, uh, what, what we have done is to uh, gather the data, the information on website, uh, in the official document uh, and uh, we uh, collected this data and created fact sheet structures uh, for each uh, territory. And uh, the main results of this uh, uh, analysis is that most of the local authorities have taken uh, long, uh, short term uh, and defensive and reactive measures than long-term oriented, proactive and offensive measures. And we also uh, identify uh, a lot of differences between the drivers 
uh, of the measures that has been taken and specifically we identify differences between uh, predominantly urban versus rural areas. We also identify that um, COVID-19 mortality levels can explain the type of measure that has been taken, long-term versus short-term uh, oriented uh, measures. And the question of the governance uh, structure is, has played an important role. That means that decentralized um, regions has taken more proactive um, measures than uh, regions that were located in uh, national uh, and centralized uh, countries. So I stop here. I thank you uh, for the attention. And here are two, um, two uh, reports and papers that has been published recently and uh, that go uh, into details uh, of the presentation that, I, uh, that I've done now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian, for this uh, comprehensive uh, report. So, uh, Volgan, you can react, and Sebastian, you can respond. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, much Sebastian, <clears throat> for this. So, Volgan, rich, oh yeah. Rich present. Did you hear me? Yeah, now, yes. Okay. Sorry for that. Um, first of all, thanks very much, Sebastian. Uh, I must say that um, in my uh, eternal attempt to uh, catch reality, I was, of course, coming across the paper that you showed on your last slide. And as you can imagine, it's quite uh, inspirational for, for the COR and for everybody who thinks regions and cities matter. So thanks for that. I also reckon that um, the ESPON program is launching Indeed, or has launched a call for a larger project that um, spans into 24, if I'm correctly informed, to look deeper into all of this, which is um, for the Committee of the Regions good news. I would have three questions, if I may. Uh, the first one is on the planning process and um, in, in, indeed what kind of uh, problems you might um, see there. The, the second one is more on uh, the macroeconomic um, level, so um, about the fiscal responses and what your judgment is on what we have seen last year as regards the budget negotiations, so it would be a personal opinion. And my last one would be on more societal um, questions, so the question of inequality across um, parts of the population. So my first question on the planning of the um, public response. I have, I have two issues here where I would like your opinion. The first issue is, now you just presented um, findings from the first two waves. Um, as I said in my presentation, this is, yeah. this is not over. So we have to plan the, uh, especially the European programs now for a period of seven years, but there must be some flexibility in this. And that is my, my, my biggest problem. Not only is it very complica uh, complex for the local authorities to plan these interventions now, but other places might you know, come up or might have less need of public support. So what would your, what be your best idea in how the question of flexibility of such long-term planning of public intervention, intervention interventions uh, could be addressed. And my second question to the planning is more critical. We have heard voices, and I think even in France, decisions of the government saying that we don't give public money or we give public money for recovery only under certain conditions. So this would be around conditionality. What would you think um, should governments make more use of this in order to foster and to enhance a green and sustainable recovery. I know the French government has said to Air France, for example, for bailouts or support, you have to shut down certain uh, too short flights to say so within the country. Um, in other countries, there was a discussion on whether or not, either not or better not, companies who don't pay taxes in Europe, uh, we know all of them, should get, should get public money. And um, there was some movement. So what do you think about these conditionalities would be my, my second reply and uh, my second question under the programming um, question. So on the more larger picture on um, fiscal responses, we know that um, I've talked about these funding and you as well uh, from the European level, but in fact, the national responses are much larger than this. 
would you say that what we saw last year is another step towards, um, how can I say, a, a permanent fiscal instrument, so not cohesion policy, but you know, a, a budget support instrument that the EU would be well advised to implement. I think the, the European Central Bank is discussing this. So are you in favor of a, a fiscal, uh, of fiscal of more fiscal federalism would be the question in short. And the last question I would uh, like your view on is, uh, now we have looked into the places, uh, the regions and the differences there, but indeed what some early uh, studies and findings from cities like Barcelona have, for example, shown that um, maybe not to a surprise for epidemi epidemiologists, but uh, there was um, not the expected spread, at least in the first wave, that was where more, let's say, well off people were hit because they were traveling. So they brought the virus from places, as you mentioned, like the Austrian Alps and so on, uh, back to their home territory. But the second wave, you could see the typical pattern of a pandemic where more poor people were hit. How would you think that um, these um, issues should be addressed? So the uneven impact on different parts of the society by um, by public interventions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, concerning the, the first question, I, I would say that the question of flexibility is very important. And, and thanks to cohesion policy uh, technical assistance, investment in human capital and support to the digital agenda, um, European regional and local public administrations have improved their capacity to reach to crises to react to, to crises. So, so the cohesion policy has contributed to building administrative capacities in a context of multi-level governance, despite significant public sector disinvestment in the last decades. And I think that uh, this crisis again call for more flexibility. So I totally agree with you uh, concerning the need for more flexibility. Concerning the negotiation, uh, this negotiation on the budget were very tough, but we have reached a deal which was far from obvious. It is a big step from my point of view for Europe because for the first time, and it's, it's important to notice it for the first time, we have chosen to go into depth together, so to share the depth. So, from this point of view, I think it's, a, it's an important uh, path for, uh, for the Europe. And the question of the conditionality uh, in, the, in the same time is very important because we cannot do as before, uh, as if nothing has happened, had happened. Uh, I think it is an opportunity to move towards a greener and more inclusive Europe. And from this point of view, the conditionality is essential. The main question is, and the main issue is uh, that, uh, as you know, some countries are against this conditionality because they, they could be in difficulties. I think to um, Hungary or Poland, for example, for Poland and the question of the green economy, we know that uh, most, of the, most of the Poland is based on the, the carbon uh, is based on the carbon production, and it, 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 it's a very uh, big problem. And uh, so the question of the, the, the conditionality is essential, but not, uh, not easy to implement uh, between the different countries. Concerning the question of, uh, do we need more fiscal federalism or not? Um, I would have said, yes, of course, we need more fiscal federalism, but in the same time, it's not obvious because we see how the negotiations were very hard uh, and were very intense. And again, I'm not sure that uh, the maturity of the different countries uh, is sufficient to, uh, to go to this uh, fiscal federalism, even if I, I, I'm pro-fiscal federalism. And concerning the, the, your, your last question, for me, the, the main issue is about the uh, social uh, inequality. The COVID-19 has revealed um, the impact uh, of COVID. The COVID-19 has revealed the, the social inequalities. 
and uh, it's an important, uh, definitely an important uh, issue. So another important issue concerning, for example, the cohesion policy uh, is that uh, cohesion policy has been an effective instrument to address uh, social issues such as poverty, uh, social deprivation, and marginalization. But the current crisis is eating harder the most vulnerable. For this reason, the social dimension of cohesion policy should be further reinforced to support recovery and promote uh, new place-based solutions. So this is, uh, from my point of view, uh, the big issue of the uh, future uh, budget of uh, the European Union and more specifically concerning the cohesion policy, the, the question of the, the social issues and the green uh, and environmental issues uh, also, yes. Okay, thank you very much, very much, uh, Sebastian Volgang. Yes, there really is a question, Volgang, for you exactly on that topic. It's a question of Isabella Mironovic, and uh, she said, dear Volgang, I feel like this green policy is as good as aspirin for the cancer. Maybe it helps. Hey. We definitely we need something stronger. And then she, was, she asked, uh, is it possible to have something stronger? Um, or, do you, or do you think these measures are well suited? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what can I say? I think uh, that it's, it's again maybe the overused picture of half full, half, half empty. I would um, agree with Sebastian that we have seen something that nobody could, um, could have imagined, yeah. given the complexity and the diversity of the European, may I say, political landscape um, last year. So um, I would say that we have embarked on something that could, can be um, headlined with solidarity between member states. Once again, we always, the Europeans, as Europeans, we always tend to see um, the negative and the low points. But if you compare this to other countries or other parts in the world, my God, we are shifting public money from one state to the other, even between regions. And uh, I mean, let's be proud on this. And of course, it's not, not perfect, but I would see that um, the time is not mature for, um, you know, a more instructive and uh, author authoritari authoritarian <laughs> sorry, uh, Europe. Um, I don't think so. I think we need to live, and that's maybe a big challenge and maybe a challenge too big for, for many. We need to live through these times of uncertainty by um, not coming out, out of the woods with immediate um, questions. Uh, with, 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 immediate, uh, with immediate replies, but maybe more often with questions. And that would, would be for me a quality, both in public, but also academic and political discourse, that we can uh, still see the positives and see the, develop, the direction of development. I know it's a too philosophical answer right now for something um, maybe that is more concrete in, in, in concrete places. But I would think that uh, there is a chance now and I come back again to this conference on the future of Europe that again also nobody would have expected that the EU institutions not only listen to the citizens but ask them to say their views and want to follow their recommendations like they did in France on climate, like they do now in Germany on Germany's role in the world, like they did in Ireland on abortion. The governments reacted to this and I think um, that's, a good, that's a good sign. And to come back to cohesion policy, um, for the experts and the nerds in, in structural funding. I mean, we have now a so-called political objective number five, which is called um, a Europe closer to the citizens. Mm -hmm. Again, the door is open for places to ask citizens on what do you want the pub what do you want to spend public money? Something known as participatory budgeting. It will not make up 100% of the funds available. No, definitely not, but it's a, it's a door open. And I would just hope that many uh, public authorities see the opportunity and, and open this and go through this open door, because this is what we need. We need the people with this, because nothing that is not planned with them works for them. So that is what, what we know in public authorities. So we have to have to be more open and more discursive. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Sebastian there is also a remark of Isabella. So she makes a remark about and, and she 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 put some references regarding the, the, the density. But I would ask, I would uh, like to turn it to a question because I was also a bit surprised by your result regarding density when you say that density has no influence on the COVID spread. So that's really um, striking regarding what uh, was expected about this because, um, and also it's a bit contradictory with the idea that COVID started in the big city cities and then spread around Europe and around the world. So could you elaborate a bit more on this yeah. very uh, interesting result and very um, um, challenging? Yes, yes. Uh, concerning, I, I can give you uh, uh, one, uh, two examples. At the country level, the, the density, the average density uh, of Germany is about 230 uh, inhabitants uh, per kilometer. Uh, and Germany is much less affected than Spain. And in Spain, uh, it's a, th there is a low density, uh, average low density. It's about 90 uh, inhabitants per uh, kilomet kilometer. So, and uh, on a finer scale, when you compare, for example, uh, in Germany, um, the West uh, has a relatively low mortality rate. Uh, for high densities, and conversely, Bavaria, the state with the highest mortality in Germany, has a lower density than the national average. So when you uh, go into detail, you, it's more complicated. So this is maybe the reason why the, the question of the density is not functioning, uh, always functioning. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, there is also a, so there is a um, reaction by Isabella who, who said it's maybe much more a question of connectivity than density. So I think it could be a small part of the Absolutely. of the explanation as you as you stated. Okay, I have another question from uh, Bogdan Ibanescu, and it's for both of you, uh, Wolfgang and Sebastian. So uh, um, Bogdan is asking about the level. The, um, the, the level uh, which is suitable for this kind of analysis. Is it NUTS 1, NUTS 2, NUTS 3 for the analysis of the pandemic? Of course, we know that, of course, the results are differing a lot. So I think that's, um, that's not an easy question, but it's interesting to investigate it. If, if we want to build the pandemic response uh, uh, at, at the subnational uh, level, Given that there is a very strong heterogeneity between the region NUT2, it, I would say that it is at the lowest level that it is necessary to uh, implement policies and give more power to local authorities. So I will answer the level NUT3 or even an infra level uh, uh, that NUT3, like, uh, like uh, the, the municipality, the local authority uh, level. And I think that it is at this uh, level that uh, the policies has to be implemented because they uh, really know uh, their territory and uh, it will give more power to, to these local authorities that has been uh, um, um, left behind when you look at the decision that has been taken. And most of the decisions were national. Um, so yes. I, I would say net three or even an infra level than net three. Yeah, from my point okay, of view, on, maybe you want to say something as well. Yeah, thank you, Andre. Thank you, Sebastian. And thanks for the question. I think that um, it all depends. I'm sorry, I have no clear answer for this. Imagine um, that you have different policy fields. Imagine just an issue like public transport. Uh, that has to be solved uh, across what we call sometimes functional areas, which are not kind of defined by municipal, um, city or regional borders, and even not by national borders sometimes. So it all depends. And I would think that the services that uh, citizens uh, are in need of, uh, which are kind of very personal services like health services, you would possibly argue in favor of um, strengthening them at the closest possible level, even below the level of municipalities. 
Um, so it, it, it depends. And it has, of course, I mean, what is clear to answer the question um, of Bogdan is that the um, distribution of EU funds is mainly based, apart from the Interact program, of course, where you have NUTS 3 um, as the eligible areas um, on NUTS 2 levels. But again, this is not a, a, a pre-decision on how the money is distributed. This needs to be arranged, I repeat, even sometimes across administrative borders, uh, depending on the policy field we are talking about and depending on the needs for the regions and for the people. Okay, thank you very much. There is a question of uh, Tatiana Gerasimenko about the, the, the situation. I don't know if you have information on that, so I ask the question. So have you tried to analyze the situation in Russia, Belarus and Ukraine? And do you trust their statistics, <laughs> which is... Uh, but... uh, the question of the statistic is not easy uh, <laughs> because uh, no, we, we didn't analyze uh, Russia, Belarus and Ukraine. But the question of the statistic is very difficult. And the question of the collection of the data uh, is very difficult. We had a lot of difficulties to gather the data, uh, even for uh, France, even for countries that uh, uh, have a quality of government which is very high, etc. So, And sometimes we had more dif less difficulties uh, in countries, uh, in Eastern countries. So, there is not a link between uh, uh, the, the level of governance, the quality of governance, and the, the possibility to collect this data. And concerning the, the, the trust in the, the statistics, I don't know. I think it's, it depends because uh, some, um, some governments uh, has an interest to have a very um, uh, accurate data. If they want to, um, if they want to, to, to reduce the impact of the COVID-19, so they have a, a very important interest to, uh, to, um, to have accurate data. Afghan, do you want to add something about it or, or not? No, but uh, but I think that one. I'm not, I'm not an expert here again, but but um, at least there are some data that should be okay to say it <laughs> to say it in easy terms on the website of um, of Eurostat. So some data for the Eastern Partnership countries um, have been collected there, including for Ukraine, uh, not for Russia, but the Eastern Partnership countries are part of the of a statistical program, and I would trust the, the statisticians. Yes. That the statistic, statisticians yeah. have agreed upon some basic quality criteria, therefore a couple of indicators, possibly all at national level, but I would have to look deeper into this and just recommend to, web, to visit Eurostar's website. Okay, thank you. I, I have a question on my own for both of you, and it's a question about co cohesion policies. So you are both specialists in cohesion policies, you know a lot uh, uh, about this. My question is very uh, kind of naive one. So uh, in your opinion, what would be the impact uh, of this uh, COVID uh, spread and cohesion policies? I would say on two, there are maybe two questions. So maybe for Sebastian, um, is there, uh, uh, do, you, do you see an impact uh, now on the, uh, the possibility to, to, to apply the, these uh, policies and also about their uh, on their results uh, nowadays. And for Wolfgang, it's more a question of uh, anticipate, uh, anticipation. So you think it will change um, the pace of the future cohesion policies and uh, maybe of the, of the directions? Because I was very impressed by your, by the, your your graph regarding the, 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 the financial aids to the countries. So it's very interesting to see that, uh, uh, for example, South con some a country like France received a lot of money. Usually it's not, it doesn't receive a lot uh, regarding cohesion policies. So does it impact this? So this is my question uh, about cohesion policies. So maybe we can start with you, Sebastian. Yeah, 
the, yeah. the cohesion policy has proven to be an effective policy tool to address many of the most recent crises, such as the, the refugee crisis in 2014, the earthquakes in central Italy in 2009 and 2016, so and now the coronavirus. So this shows that cohesion policy can rapidly respond to emergency uh, situations. And however, the question is whether cohesion policy should be the main instrument to face these uh, crises when it is intended to uh, address uh, long-term uh, objectives. So the question is, uh, the cohesion policy try to address long-term objectives and this crisis is uh, it's a short-term uh, crisis. So how to deal with this question of the temporality? And another question that can be addressed when we talk about the cohesion policy is that the cohesion policy addresses spatial inequalities, especially in peripheral regions, territories, the urban rural divide, etc. However, if the policy scope is extended to more explicitly address health policy objectives, which is not the, the case for the moment, the cohesion policy will need a substantial increase uh, in resource and funding to avoid the substitution effect, whereby support for other fundamental investment aim at preserving and improving quality of life across uh, Europe is reduced. So this is, a, this is one of my concerns now concerning the, the, the cohesion policy, yes. Volgang. Thank you very much for the question. Um, my answer would be twofold because you asked what will COVID change as regards the design, uh, maybe also the effectiveness of cohesion policy. I would look into the last year and put a little bit of wa uh, water into the wine of the positive picture that we have drawn on, you know, enhanced solidarity, bigger budgets. Why is that? Because I think that the price that um, especially local heroes, local actors have to pay now for higher funding, for higher funding injections is a complexity explosion. I would call it complexity explosion because I have worked for a ministry here for regional affairs in one German region for a couple of years implementing funds. And at that time, you still had community initiatives, objective one, two, three programs. That was already complex enough, I can tell you. Different funds, different objectives, sometimes even down to the level of districts, um, a program like Urban, which is coming back, by the way, uh, with the uh, European Urban Initiative. Now, I do think um, that is possible that we possibly have to deal with an over complex uh, funding structure now coming from coming down from the European level to the local actors. And that is, of course, nothing for Sunday talks of presidents of EU institutions, but there will be a response, I'm quite sure. And it, I'm not sure whether it will be a positive one. So complexity overload, first, first part. And the second part, you mentioned the columns and the different shades of uh, EU funding and the orange, so the recovery and resilience fund being what some have called already in articles, a threat to cohesion policy. Why is that? For the first time, and plannings or have been ongoing for quite a while in the European Commission, there is no such thing for funding of costs, ex post funding of costs. The logic of the resilience uh, of the recovery and resilience fund is that you have targets. France has to reduce its CO2 emissions or take people out of poverty until this and that level. And France, to say so, or the authorities will only be paid when results are achieved. This is a complex, com complete change of, of public funding thinking. And again, the Court of Auditors, the Parliament, some have, uh, DG Budget of the European Commission, have argued for a while that th this should be the case. And this is a threat to cohesion policy for which you have to plan programs, objectives, implement projects, collect the invoices, and then you can ask to be refunded. And that is a threat, and I think, and I hope, it is a threat towards the good direction that such public funding will be based, again, on results on, uh, that everybody can understand. It's a complex thing to do. I'm not saying that it is easy, but it would do away possibly with too many rules and too many rule, bo rule books, too many funds maybe in the end, 
that are there on the market. That would be my hope. Uh, and again, uh, it's, um, a door is open and people should go through it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. OK, 